morning, everyone. Before I get started, I was given a note, which means I should probably start with the note before I forget to read the note. Uh, the tea party that is on the 14th, uh, they would like to have a count by the 8th just to make sure they have everything available. Uh, so please sign up by next Sunday with your totals if you are going to that. Also, the very next day on that Monday will be a ladies' meeting at 6 p.m. here at the church. Um, any other questions, see D or Donna or one of the other ladies who take care of that. Um, I feel like there was something else. Oh, also D gave me this morning the VBS curriculum. So that is all set. And Will did an amazing job on getting that done and getting that to us in plenty of time to get ready for this summer. And I know I'm looking forward to that. And I hope you all are as well. With that said, let's go ahead and jump into this here. We are in our dedicated series. And if you remember last week, we took the first step of hearing. And hopefully you heard me last week when we talked about the first step. We talked about hearing, we talked about listening, and we talked about applying and understanding all of that. This week, we're going on to our, our second step here, which is believe. You can also notice that in the little bottom corner there on the first step is, is here. Because as we talked about last week, with these steps, the first one just doesn't go away after you have it. You have to build upon that first step in order to get to the second step. And so last week we heard, and now this week I asked the question of, do you believe? Or what do you believe? If you remember back to, to last summer, there was a, a sermon that I showed some, some different pictures. There was a picture of a Pepsi versus Coke. There was a picture of a lightly toasted marshmallow versus a, a burnt marshmallow. There was a hot dog at various stages of doneness and crispness. There was also a picture of bacon, I think, that was, that was slightly cooked and then completely eviscerated. Um, you can see where I believe which bacon is the best on that. But what do we believe? Each of those different things is a belief. Some people believe Pepsi is better than Coke. Some people believe Coke is better than Pepsi. Some people believe that toasted marshmallows are burnt than those crispy marshmallows that just ooze off of the stick. Those are all different beliefs. But what we're talking about this morning is a little bit different than just those kind of beliefs. Those beliefs are more opinions. But what are your convictions? What convicts you? What beliefs do you have that cause stirring emotions inside of you? Now, I know some people who get pretty stirred up over whether Pepsi is better or Coke is better, and I've seen some people arguing in the stores about that. But what do your convictions tell you? What are your convictions calling to you? Now, I had a video that was supposed to play at this point in time, but, you know, technology is a great thing when it works. And so you'll just have to hear me talk a little bit longer than, than what I would have usually gone to if the video had worked. But I want you to look, paint this picture in your mind. There's Jesus and this rabbi. And this rabbi's name is, is Nicodemus. And he's a very highly respected rabbi. And in fact, he's one of the rabbis that goes from town to town to kind of observe and to, to look over the other rabbis and the other, other teachers of the law. Almost a, a principle of rabbis, if you will. And so they're talking, in because Nicodemus has, has seen things that Jesus has done. He's heard Jesus teach, and he's heard, heard him preach, and he's heard him take care of, of his flock. And he's kind of beginning curious. And he questions himself. He goes, how, how can you do these things? There is no possible way you can do these things unless you have God on your side. Unless you are directly from God, there is no possible way for a man to do these things. I've heard the fiery teachings that you give, but yet I have seen no man who tells a paralytic to get up and to walk. And to not only tell him that, but then the man gets up and walks. These miracles you perform, these words you profess, there's God behind these words. And then Jesus goes on to tell Nicodemus about why he is here. That he has come to establish his kingdom. But not 
the political kingdom that everybody expects him to be there to establish. Jesus then goes on to explain that he is there to spread the message of baptism by water, of being reborn. Now Nicodemus is hearing all of these things. He is listening to what Jesus is saying. Some aspects he understands, but in other aspects, if you read the first couple verses of of first John of John chapter three, he begins to question Jesus about this rebirth. That surely he doesn't mean coming back from the womb again. That is not the rebirth that Jesus is talking about. And in verse nine here, this is where we will pick it up. In John chapter three, verse nine, Nicodemus asks him, "How are these things?" Possible? How is this rebirth possible? How are you performing these miracles possible? How are you teaching these things? How is this possible? How are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, You are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things. How can you possibly believe me even if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned. But the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. This should sound very familiar to our call to worship this morning. Well, because it's the exact same verses that Jack read this morning. Now, this is pretty substantial things that that Jesus is talking here. If we look at just, we'll go back here. We'll look, call this one intellectual faith. Intellectual faith. That is faith that comes from your mind. And I kind of subtitled this faith that saves. Because believing is a part of faith. Having faith shows what you believe. And so we have to think about our faith. We have to understand our faith. Our faith is equally emotional as it is mental. And for some of us, it's more mental than it is emotional. For some of us, it's more emotional than it is mental. But we'll get into both aspects here. And I call this intellectual faith that we get into here. Now, if we go back and we look at this, Jesus mentions understanding Jesus mentions understanding here. This should sound familiar to our last topic or our last headline of last week. We first had to hear. We then had to understand. And then we had to apply. Jesus is saying, you don't understand. I am telling you all of these things. I am showing you all of these things. You can clearly see me doing these miracles. You can clearly hear me professing the word of God. And yet you still don't understand. Even after I'm explaining it to you, very deliberately in very plain language, you still don't understand. And because you don't understand, you won't believe. Because you don't understand, you won't believe. And so first, before we can believe, we first have to hear and understand. It's like these steps are actually going in the same direction and working together. Don't worry, I didn't plan this. This is the way it works as far as steps go. First, we have to understand, then we believe. But if you don't understand, you won't believe. Jesus here is giving testimony. Nicodemus is seeing with his eyes. Now, he can't explain it intellectually. But yet if we look throughout the life of Jesus, we understand that Jesus was a person. The name Jesus of Nazareth is written down in historical documents. If we look at the historical event of the crucifixion, there are 15 hand witnesses, historical witnesses, to the events of the crucifixion. Fifteen. 
And that was over 2,000 years ago. And there's 15 eyewitnesses, handwritten accounts of the crucifixion. There have been numerous times where people have tried to debunk the crucifixion only to believe more fully in the crucifixion. If you look at the story of the case for Christ, that is a pretty glaring example of someone who did not believe, who became a believer because they could not prove the crucifixion as a false event. On top of that, if we look at the... We look through that 6,000 years of history. Not just the 2,000 from Jesus to today, but the 6,000 that completely encompasses the world. 90% of biblical archaeology is still undiscovered. I find that absolutely amazing. It's been 6,000 years, and we're still finding evidence of the things within the Bible are true. 6,000 years, and we're still finding evidence of civilizations mentioned in the Bible, of battles mentioned in the Bible, of people who lived in the Bible. In fact, it seems as if we grow into this digital age that we need more signs, we need more proof, we need more evidence of things. That because of the internet and special effects and being able to isolate different things that we now have more skeptics than ever. Oh, that didn't happen. That was fake. This is how it was faked. But yet, it seems like the more we get into it, the more we study Scripture, the more we study the Bible, the more we study archaeology of the Bible, the more we find that the Bible is true. More evidence to support the Bible. This is where our intellectual faith comes from. We first have to understand in order to believe. But because Nicodemus won't believe testimony and the things he sees firsthand he sees it happening in front of him but he still doesn't believe he has the messiah the savior of the world in front of him and still he doesn't believe his heart here is clearly telling him one thing and his mind is clearly telling him something completely different and because he won't believe how can he possibly believe the heavenly thing he doesn't understand what is happening in front of him. How can he clearly understand the mission that Jesus is completely on? I think the same thing that Nicodemus is struggling with is the same thing that we still struggle with. We know what we're supposed to believe. We know what we're supposed to do. We understand what Jesus' mission was on earth, but we can't wrap our mind around the fact that Jesus came to die for the sins that even I We understand that it says Jesus died for the sins of the world, but part of that world is me. It's the things I struggle with. It's the sins that I commit. That was Jesus' mission. And I understand that's a hard thing to wrap our minds around. But if we talk more about it, we'll have more things. The second part is the emotional faith. The emotional faith. And we talked about this a little bit a little bit last week. But that emotional feeling you get when you pray or when you talk to God or when you feel closest to God. Chris and I were talking this week and and how we want to remember and how we want to move forward from things that have happened, from the accident that has happened. And I remember telling her, you know, or remember her telling me that despite this dark tragedy, despite the darkness that has come, there's also this beautifulness to it. This beautifulness of a community coming together. The beautifulness of a church coming together. The beautifulness of God's closeness. Because it's almost been like church camp conversion that I've talked about before where you get the the right amount of motion, you get the right song playing, you get the right tempo, you get the right sounds and all of a sudden you you get these goosebumps and it's, you feel the Holy Spirit in that moment except this last week, these last two weeks I 
haven't lost that yet. In the darkness of this, with Chris and I's faith, I have felt the closeness of God. I felt God wrapping his arms around us. Despite everything happening, we have never been closer to God. And I told Krista, I don't want to let this feeling go. I don't want to forget this feeling. I don't want to leave this closeness of God. You know, if you look further a little bit into John chapter 3, we get a little bit more of what I'm talking about. Verse 13 no one has ever gone into heaven and returned. No one has ever gone into heaven and returned. We hear these feel-good stories about a little boy who dies and, and goes to heaven, but then comes back. Of course, then that was later proved to be a doctored statement, a doctored testimony. It was all made up. But we hear stories of, of people having these experiences where they die and then they come back. But it says here in scripture that no one has died, no one has gone to heaven, and no one has returned from heaven. Elijah rode a chariot to heaven. I believe his name was Enoch, ended up riding, going to heaven in the same manner without dying, but yet they have not come back to earth. Not yet anyway, until the final judgment, until his final ascension. But we see here, no one has gone into heaven and no one has come back from heaven. But what Jesus has done here in the second part, but the son of man who was in heaven came down out of heaven. Notice what it says here. It didn't say that Jesus was on earth. Jesus was a man and went to heaven and then came back from heaven. It doesn't mention anything about Lazarus who, who died and then Jesus brought him back. It doesn't mention anything about him going to heaven. But the son of man who was already in heaven, already experiencing paradise, came out of heaven, came down from heaven. The son of man came down. Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness. Now we hear this, but do we know where this comes from? Do we know what this is referencing? What is Jesus saying to Nicodemus here? Well, Nicodemus, being a rabbi and being a teacher of the law and being versed in this since the time he was 13 years old and even younger, Nicodemus would have known. Now, when I first saw this, the, the imagery that pops up in my mind is, is Moses coming to Pharaoh and having his staff turn into a snake. That is the first thing that I thought of. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. The story Jesus is referencing comes all the way back from Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. Let me flip here real quick to that. I didn't have this posted in my notes because I wasn't going to go into it too much. But I think it's important that we understand what we are talking about, what Jesus is talking about, and what Jesus is referencing. So if we look at Numbers chapter 20 or verse chapter 21 verses 4 through 8. The people in Israel are wandering around the desert. They're wondering where their food is coming from. They wonder where their water is going to come from. They wonder where their reasoning for being here is. They're at the point where they're thinking maybe if we just go back to Pharaoh Maybe if we just go back to Egypt, at least we'll have a place to sleep. At least we'll have a full belly when we go to sleep. At least we'll have water when it's given to us. Maybe the life under Pharaoh is better than just this wandering around. Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with a long journey, and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There is nothing to eat here and nothing to drink. We hate this horrible man. And so verse 6 says, So the Lord sent poisonous snakes. Snakes of fire, some translations say. 
And so because of their complaining, Jesus sent these snakes to remind them who is in control and who has the power here. If these people were bitten by the snakes, they would surely die because there is no medicine in this time. There is no hospital in this time. They're in the middle of the desert. But yet God tells Moses to erect a bronze pole with a snake attached to it. And if they lift their eyes to this bronze pole, then they will be saved. If they are bitten by the poison of these snakes, all they have to do is raise their eyes to this bronze snake and they will be saved. Just as this pole was woven in the wilderness, the Son of Man must also be risen, must also be put on a pole, must also be lifted up above a crowd. Because as the Israelites in in Numbers chapter 21 here, as they lift their eyes and realize that this bronze statue is from God, it is God's promise that he will save them. And so we lift our eyes to the Jesus who is on the cross and realize that we can also be saved from the sin that we are bitten with, the sin that we are poisoned by, the sin that we are infected with. Just as the snake is bitten, the Son of Man must also be lifted up. So everyone who believes in him, everyone who believes in him, in him. In these first eight verses of, of John chapter 3, verses 9 through 17, five different times Jesus mentions the word believe. Then the next three verses, Jesus mentions it another three times. That's eight times Jesus mentions the word believe. Much like last week when we talked about this, Jesus mentioned the term listen and hear eight different times. Well, actually five different times in that, but then eight different times further down the line. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but last week and this week, both of these teachings come directly from the voice of Jesus, come directly from the words that Jesus spoke. And so I'm not going to differentiate much or try not to differentiate much into into the Old Testament or into the New Testament to Paul or any of his writings or Peter in any of his writings, but I want us to focus on Jesus because this is Jesus telling the world who he is. This is Jesus telling us to listen to him, to hear him. And then once we hear him, to believe in him. So everyone that believes in him will have eternal life. This is a very emotional aspect of things. In fact, we get a little bit of another emotional aspect if we look at at the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Just a couple verses after John 3, 16, Jesus goes to a well. Jesus goes to this well not for any water, but it's as if he had an appointment there. It was midday, and usually by midday, if you needed water, you had already gotten your water. Because midday in the middle of the Middle East gets pretty, pretty warm. And so Jesus knew who he was going to meet at this well. If we look at verses 24 through 29, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then, Jesus' disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? This woman didn't hear any of Jesus' teachings. She didn't see any of Jesus' miracles. She simply reacted to the words being told from her, being told to her. Simply this exchange between Jesus and this woman was enough for her to believe. 
was enough for her to come to an understanding that she knew there was a Messiah coming. She didn't know when. She didn't know what the mission would be. She didn't really understand much, but she understood this man to be the Messiah simply because of her emotional reaction to the conversation. This wasn't anything that you can put scientific numbers on. This wasn't anything that you could measure her response to. It was simply her emotional connection to Jesus. Now, I want to make the distinction here that intellectual faith and emotional faith, these two have to come together. These can't be two distinct things. These have to be a cohesive thing. Because as much as we would like to get those goosebump feeling every time we hear a song or, or every time the Spirit moves in us, we'd like to feel it. We would like to feel God every chance we got, but God doesn't work in feelings. God works in our realities. But also we must realize that we can't get bogged down in an intellectual faith either. Because I myself have, have been there before, where I want to know everything about the Bible. I want to know what everything means within the Bible. I want to understand every aspect of what Jesus is saying. And the more you study the Bible, the more you understand the Bible, the more you realize you know nothing at all about life. And so it almost as if the more you hunger for knowledge, the more the Bible takes from you, the more God takes from you, because you have to realize that the more you understand, the more you realize how much you need God, how much in order to understand the world, you need God. And so as much as we understand, as much as we want to understand, we also have to be able to feel God. We have to be feeling the Holy Spirit. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to move within us. These two have to go together. Too much of one can bankrupt the other, and too much of the other can bankrupt the other. They have to work together. Because there's going to be times when we don't feel God, but we still have to understand that he's there. There's going to be times where we try to outthink God only to realize that that's an impossible task. These two go hand in hand. The last point of this is faith that moves faith that moves we can feel God we can understand God to a certain extent but what good is any of that unless we are moved by it unless we allow ourselves to be moved by it there's a common common kind of phrase or kind of comment about scripture allow yourself to be moved by the things that move God Allow yourself to be upset by the things that upset God. Allow yourself to feel the way God feels about certain topics. You all remember those bracelets, I guess it's been quite a few years now, the what would Jesus do bracelets. What would Jesus do? Jesus is a man of action. If Jesus felt in his soul to do something, he went and did it. What good for us is to hear the word, understand the word, make changes in our life, but then do no more than that. I mean, if we go into the whole story of the book of James, where James is famously quoted as saying, faith without works is dead. But I think Jesus' best words in this matter come from Matthew chapter 28 verses 16 through 20 then the 11 disciples left for Galilee going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go when they saw him they worshiped him but some doubted let's stop and look at that point Jesus has come back Jesus is alive and Jesus sent for his disciples to meet him at this mountain they had already spent time with Jesus and seen that Jesus is truly the Jesus who is alive. They had seen him dead. They had heard of him being dead, and now they see him fully alive in front of them. But notice what it says at the end of verse 17. But some 
of them doubted. Some of them were too wrapped up in their emotional faith and their intellectual faith to realize what was happening in front of them. The numbers didn't make sense in their heart. Or their emotions told them that Jesus was already dead and this couldn't possibly be Jesus. But yet Jesus told them again and again that he was going to die, but that he was going to rise again. And yet when they see him, they doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Therefore, go and make disciples. They had already heard the teachings of Jesus. They'd lived with Jesus for three plus years. And now Jesus was telling them, this is why those three years happened. This is why this has been so important. Because now you are going to go. Now you are going to do these things. You heard me teach. You watched me preach. You believed in who I was. Now it is your turn with that belief, with that faith to go and do the same thing that I did with you to the world. Jesus said it was your time for the disciples to go. So let's finish up here with John 3, 16 and 17. For this is how we know God loved the world. Notice what it says here. It says, gave his one and only son. He gave his one and only son. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And look at this part here. It says God sent his son sent his son. This should give you two different aspects of God and Jesus here. God gave his son up. God gave his son up to sin so that we could live. But it was also a mission. It was also the mission. God just didn't do this because he wanted to or because he was forced to. Sin didn't force God's hand gave his one and only son because he sent his one and only son because of his love because of his love he gave his son but because of his love he sent his son this was God's will this was God's purpose this was Jesus's purpose in life to show us God's love so that we may choose Jesus so that we may choose God. God didn't send Jesus to force us to love him. God didn't send Jesus to make us love him. Because if that was the case, God could have went like that and it was done. God could have snapped his fingers and we were all saved. God could have snapped his fingers and sin would have been wiped out. But that doesn't sound like a very loving it sounds like a loving God who gave up his son to show us how special we are to him. Everyone who believes, everyone who believes, not just the disciples, not just the apostles, not just those who followed Jesus, not just the Jewish people who had the covenant established through Moses and through David and through Abraham, but everyone everyone who believes in Jesus everyone who believes that Jesus is the son of God must also believe in God but also believe in the mission and the gospel that Jesus spread the good news that Jesus spread that we are no longer controlled by earthly desires but we are controlled by the grace of God because we choose to be because we choose to believe will not perish, will not die to a snake bite, will not die to the infection of sin, but have eternal life because we raise our eyes to the cross and believe in the message of the cross and believe in the resurrection of Jesus. 
as we close out this morning, I'll have Ann come back up and we'll move into our time of, of invitation. The reason the girls aren't here this morning is, is Brinley ended up getting a little sick yesterday. Hopefully one of these days in the next couple weeks, we'll all be back in church at the same time. But last night while she was sick, I was out finishing up some, some stuff for, for today's message. And she asked Krista, where's, where's daddy? And then she said, no, he's not, he's not working on the sermon. As soon as I heard that, I shut my notebook. I shut the laptop. I ran in and I laid down with Brinley. I don't know how long it'll last that having her daddy makes her feel better. That just being with her daddy is comforting. But all she knew is she wanted her dad. Do you believe in enough in Jesus? Do you believe that God is the father who makes us feel better, who comforts us? That when we ask, do you believe in? What are you convicted by? And is it enough to know our Father is there for anything we're going through? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the message that John 3, 16 and 17 provides for us. But Lord, I thank you so much for, for the whole story. John chapter 3 that in order to believe we must first hear and understand we must see the full picture we must understand why the bronze snake was erected in the desert into the wilderness just as much as we understand why Jesus was put on a cross and hung there for us from Genesis to Revelation your story lives within us we understand why Jesus was sent. We hear it throughout scripture. But Lord, this morning I pray that we understand why we believe what we believe. Lord, I ask this morning that the Holy Spirit moves within us to reveal a little bit about ourselves this morning. To show us truly what we believe and why we believe. So that we may come closer to you so that we may be drawn closer to you. Lord, I pray all of this in the name of the one who died for me, but then has also risen again for me. It's in Jesus' name I pray.